My name is Alexander. I'm a research director at UC Berkeley. My main fields are data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of that. But I've also had a true passion for blockchain uh, and blockchain technology for the past three years. Three years ago, I looked into an initiative where I tried to improve the remittance process and also transferring humanitarian aid to developing countries together with the UN using blockchain technology. Right now, I'm also the co-founder of UC Berkeley's Blockchain Lab. Apart from that, I've also had an entrepreneurial journey. I've been part of the founding team of three companies, and my academic background is in mathematical statistics. So I'm not going to have a hype talk where I'm talking about how the future will be powered by blockchains, etc. But what I'm going to do is that I'm going to set the stage for the other speakers by explaining blockchain technology step by step. So it will be kind of a technical talk, not as technical as the other speakers, but bear with me. So the, the first question uh, I want to ask is, who in here has ever done a Bitcoin transaction? If you could raise your hands. And who in here has ever done a transaction with another cryptocurrency except for Bitcoin? If you could raise your hand. Has anyone in here ever used a smart contract? If you could raise your hand. OK, two people. Uh, and has anyone used a decentralized application? That's my last question. Same. OK, but great. Then I know approximately that we have some experts here in the audience. Feel free to like, add to what I'm saying. And then for most people, the, uh, this might be like new concepts. So I'm going to build it up step by step. And in order to give you an understanding about blockchains and how they work, first I'm going to talk about Bitcoin. So if you realize the power and beauty of Bitcoin and the whole revolution that that brought to the world, then I think you have an easier time to understand blockchains. So in order to understand Bitcoin and why it's so cool, you will have to understand money. So now I would like to ask my second question to you, uh, and that is, what is money? Do, do I have like, any suggestions? It might seem to be a very simple question. Medium of transaction. Medium of transaction. Any other suggestions? Yeah? It's a promissory note. Promissory note. I believe it's a value agreed by two parties. Uh, you know, it can be anything. If it's a value, it's agreed by two parties. Exactly. So all of these suggestions are great, and they are also true. But there are many defi definitions of money, and these are my favorite ones. So I would say that money is a medium of, of exchange. It's a way for us to facilitate the exchange of value between people, parties, entities. Money also exists in order to scale the economy. So we can divide value up into subunits. Before we had money, maybe we had a bartering society where we were trading. So I might want to trade my horse for your cow. <laughs> but then I might think that, well, my horse is actually worth 1.2 of your cows. And then we didn't have like a clean way to settle that trade by you not adding maybe like some oats or whatever. So, so, so money exists in order to facilitate that process and speed that process up. We abstract value uh, into another form. Money also requires trust in order to work. All the people that are in any type of transaction need to trust that the money will keep value over time and that it has value right now in order for money to work. So moving on, in order to understand the power of Bitcoin, you also have to understand banks. So now I would like to ask you, what is the function of a bank? So it's a centralized intermediary, right? And we, we trust this agency, this centralized party, to store. Like, I put my paycheck into a bank. If I get checks, I put that into the bank. And I trust them to keep both to like, make sure that my account balances are up to date. And also, that I, whenever I want to take out this, uh, these resources that I store at the bank, I will be able to do that. Banks are also uh, the gatekeepers into the whole global financial system. So in order to open up a bank account, you have to prove who you are by showing your passport or driver's license. And then they will do some background checks and see, OK, is this person fit to actually have a bank account? And there are many, many people on the planet who don't have access to the financial system. So this is something that Bitcoin might solve. But 
Lastly, banks also offer like, many different paid services. We could like, take loans. They could help us invest in stocks, etc., etc. So that is a function of a bank. But now we have talked a little bit about contemporary money. Let's move forward and look at how money, uh, what forms it has been in throughout the history. So if we rewind many, many years back, over 10,000 years before Christ, then some history scholars actually claim that money is the oldest technology that we have on the planet, that it predates like the wheel, it predates writing, et cetera, et cetera. So back then in those times, this was a type of abstraction of value, often through the use of rare objects, like feathers, pearls, something that we can find in nature that we didn't have an abundance of, that we then would trade for different goods and stuff that we wanted. The first systemized money system that we know of uh, was developed in Lydia, in today's Turkey. And these were metal coins. This technology later spread to the Roman Empire, to the Greeks, etc. Then it was, it, we used this technology for many, many years. But then in the 1200s, in China, they invented notes. So all of a sudden, we had paper money that were issued by a certain agency. So metal coins, I mean, they still contain like copper and silver and gold, etc. So these rare metals. But the notes could be signed by the emperor, for example, or a rudimentary type of banks. The next invention that we had when it comes to money was in the 15th century, around the Renaissance period in Italy, when banks started to emerge. And one of the most prominent banking families in Italy at this time is called the Medici family. What they brought to the world was uh, the double entry ledger system. So this is a debit and credit system where we track withdrawals and deposits. This was a huge revolution in finance and inspired most of the central banks on the planet. The next invention in money uh, happened in England where they wanted to bring stability to prices. So during this time, prices fluctuated a lot. They were very, very like volatile, just as the crypto markets have been. <laughs> Uh, throughout recent years. But so in order to bring stability to prices, what the Bank of England said was that they would redeem any notes, any British pounds for actual gold, if a citizen wanted that. So they introduced a gold standard. This was the, uh, adopted by most of the developed world for 100 years approximately. Then after World War I, most governments found themselves in a situation where they needed to increase the money supply but they couldn't go out and go and dig for gold in order to increase the gold that was backing these currencies. So most countries in the world adopted fiat currency. So fiat currency is not backed by any type of physical object, by any type of repository of value. Instead, the only reason why fiat currency and fiat money, why it has value, is because we trust the issuing agency that it has value. So we will trust the central bank or the Federal Reserve or whoever is like printing money that the money that they are printing actually carries value. And the latest invention in money, at least according to me, is some sort of digital money where we have our credit cards. So we encode money into accounts and we can uh, withdraw them. And this happened in the 50s in the US. So fast forward to 2008. We had the major like financial crisis. A lot of people lost faith in the whole banking industry, in the monetary system that we have in the developed world. And exactly during this time, the invention of Bitcoin was introduced to the world. And Bitcoin is also based on blockchain technology. So this is how these two are interlinked. But so let's look a little bit about the decade of history that Bitcoin has, got, has had so far. It was introduced in 2008 by a person or a group of people called Satoshi Nakamoto. What is intriguing by this is that no one up until this date knows who this person is. And since I'm going to explain that in a little bit, but the whole transaction history of every Bitcoin is open for anyone to look into. So we can actually see uh, the Bitcoin that Satoshi Nakamoto mined so that he got in the beginning of Bitcoin's history. And that value is roughly equal to 1 million Bitcoin today. 
and that hasn't been moved since like 2012. That's an equivalent in dollar values to $10 billion with today's market cap. So that's amazing. No one knows who it is. He only like gave this huge technology to the world, never claimed that it's my invention or took credit for it. Let's move forward to 2010. That was the first year when bitcoins were used in a transaction with the real world. When a person in Florida bought two pizzas that were worth $25 for 10,000 bitcoin. <laughs> so back then, one bitcoin was worth a quarter of a cent. A lot has happened since. Uh, in 2011, we started to see the first altcoins. So these were technologies that were built on top of Bitcoin that tried to improve the protocols and the technology. Some famous examples are Namecoin and Litecoin. We say that the Bitcoin price is very volatile today, uh, but actually the largest crash ever in Bitcoin's history happened from one day to another in November in 2013, where the price of Bitcoin fell by 87%. We also had a hack of one of the biggest exchanges where you could trade different coins with one another in the cryptocurrency space. And this exchange was called Mt. Gox. In this hack, 6% of all Bitcoin ever created was stolen. And that had a rough market value of $500 million. So this was a huge hit to the community. But for the last two years, I would say that Bitcoin, ICOs, cryptocurrencies, blockchains, they have really like entered the mainstream. And that is the reason why we are here early this morning to learn about this technology. So also because there has been so much hype around this area, the, the Bitcoin price actually climbed up to almost like $19,000 in December last year. So you, you can compare that to a quarter of a cent only <laughs> seven years prior to that. And here is a graph of how the Bitcoin price has developed. So as you can see, last year, a lot of things happened. But moving on, now we should talk about the technology. Let's actually dive into how this works and why it's so important, why it's cool. <coughs> so how I would define Bitcoin is that it's a digital and decentralized currency. So this is the first widely adopted digital currency that we have had on the planet. So this is remarkable because, as you might remember, in the like, 90s and beginning of the 2000s, Many industries were disrupted because of the internet, because we were able to digitalize, for example, a record or a movie. And then when you have a digital copy of something, then you can copy it more and more and more and share it with your friends, share it with your peers. But Bitcoin solves this when it comes to money, because now we will actually have a scarce unit that we cannot copy. We cannot double spend it. I cannot send you one Bitcoin, and then I'll, it's impossible for me to send you that same Bitcoin when it has been sent to you. And this is cool because it's, like, uh, it's a technology built on digital information. It's also regulated by a community, and that is what I mean by decentralized. No one owns Bitcoin. Not a single person can say how the Bitcoin protocol should work. But it's a majority vote, a democratic system that anyone can join. You in here can be part of the Bitcoin community after leaving this boot camp today. Bitcoin is also about financial inclusion. You don't have to show your driver's license or your passport in order to open up a Bitcoin account and start trading with Bitcoins. Bear in mind that the full transaction history, as I told you recently, is transparent. Anyone can watch this. So this is called a pseudonymous network because it might be easy to track these hashes that are on a ledger, all the transactions, even though you haven't said that I'm the person with like a driver's license, it might be possible to track your transactions to you. Bear that in mind. It's not completely anonymous, Bitcoin. Um, and you should know that. Also, the ledgers are public. So anyone can check that transactions has really happened. It's not like in the banking system where it's very opaque. And only the people who work at the bank can check the ledgers and have access right to that. Last but not least, what Bitcoin enables us to do is that we can transfer money peer to peer. So I can send money to you without any trusted third party, without any intermediary facilitating this uh, transaction. Before, 
that might have been a, we might have been able to do that with cash, but then we must be physically present. Now we can actually transfer money anywhere on the globe in a matter of seconds without having to trust anyone to do that transaction for us. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, when you we opened this blockchain, mm -hmm. you dive right into Bitcoin. I understand it's one of the applications, but is it just so prominent? That's why you are any broader context. So, if we go back to this slide here, uh, then Bitcoin is, as I said, the first technology that introduced blockchains. Blockchains hadn't existed on the planet before Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin was introduced, in order for Bitcoin to work, we needed blockchains. So what we can say is that Bitcoin is almost like the killer app for blockchains, just as email was the killer app for the internet. So this is a good comparison. And if you understand how Bitcoin works, then you will understand blockchains. So you, that is the context that I would like to give you. So let's take a look at some numbers before we dive into how Bitcoin transactions get settled. Um, the global market cap of all cryptocurrencies as of the beginning of this year was $820 billion. This is 1% of the total GDP of the world. It's crazy. A lot has happened uh, in the recent years. Also, there are about 3 to 6 million unique users of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies. Only 5 to 7% of these people are female. This is not good for gender equality. And the same figures are reproduced when it comes to developers in this space, people who develop applications on blockchains. And then also the disk space. If you wanted to download the whole like Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain, then they take up several hundred gigabytes. And this also becomes a problem because we cannot remove any information. We cannot remove transactions. So this only increases over time. And then the price of Bitcoin, at least from yesterday evening, then one Bitcoin was worth $9,300. And one Ether, which is the coin in Ethereum, was worth 640 I would also like to make a distinction when it comes to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin with a lowercase b, then we talk about the currency. This is the money of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin with a capital B, that is the technology, what is powering this whole system. Bear that in mind when you're reading about this, uh, it's very important. So, let's now say that you want to use blockchain technology for the first time. The easiest way to do that would be to actually make a Bitcoin transaction. That is why I asked that in the beginning of the lecture, who had done that in here. So if we look at Bitcoin from a user perspective here, you can see an actually like Bitcoin transaction, how that looks in code, the output in your computer, if you would dive into it. But it's easier uh, to take part of this network. The reason of existence for Bitcoin is to make simple transactions with some sort of like digital currency, as I've said. And the way that you do that is that you download a software wallet client. These can exist in many different forms. But basically what they do is that they generate a public key and a private key for you. The public key, you can share that with everyone. That is your address where you say, this is where I would like to receive my Bitcoin. And the private key, you use that to sign transactions and prove ownership of currency in this network. So only to um, further like, emphasize that, your private key, you should always keep that secret. If you're part of any like cryptocurrency network, if, you're start, if you start using these technologies, the private key is like a password. If someone gets a hold of your password, they can log into your account, they can transfer your Bitcoin wherever, your Bitcoin, they are lost. Also, there is no recovery option for your private key. If you lose it, I mean, if you keep it in a vault and uh, all of a sudden you forget the combination to the vault, you can't get into it, then there is no recovery option. You can never get a hold of your private key again until you're able to open up the vault. So the private key is a fixed length string. You can see an example of one down here. And as I said, we use that to sign transactions to prove ownership of Bitcoins or any other like cryptocurrency. So your public key is created from your private key. The way that you do that is that you use a one-way function 
So your public key is deterministic. This is so cool how this works. I don't have time to go into the nitty gritty details, but I think that uh, either Jillian or Shiva might mention this later today. But the way that you generate the public key is that you take your private key and then you pass it through something that is called the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So every time when you pass in your private key through this algorithm, you will always get the same public key. But it's impossible to recreate the private key by looking at the public key. This is the magic. So then you might also ask yourselves, well, now we have the public and private key. I'm able to sign transactions, take part of this network, and I also have my public key as an address in order to be able to receive Bitcoin, right? But how does the actual Bitcoin network work? So let's say that you have your private key, your wallet software. I say that I want to send you some Bitcoin. So I go ahead and sign that transaction. Then I broadcast that to a network. So this is the network that also holds the blockchain. This is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network of computers that are connected to one another, that validates payments, and keeps track of transactions. So we need this. This is the bank. This is the decentralized bank that keeps track of all the account balances, etc. What is so remarkable about this is that it's a trustless system. So anyone in here, you can actually go ahead and download the full Bitcoin node right now and start to maintain this network. It's open for anyone. So we trust a community of users, anyone on the planet. This is a trustless system. What it also means that it's distributed and decentralized is that we have no central point of failure. If someone was to uh, take down my bank and all of their servers, then my account balances would be lost. For, in order to take down the Bitcoin network, you have to take down all computers. These are like several hundred thousands or millions. No one knows for sure how many computers are participating in this network. But you would have to destroy all of them. And they exist globally. That's almost an impossible task. So Bitcoin manages to get around what is called the honeypot problem. We could see this with like the Equifax breach and stuff, that it's really bad when we have data in only one single repository like that. So the nodes or the computers participating in this network that validate transactions, they are called miners. And what they do is that they group transactions into blocks, and then they link them together in an immutable chain. And this is what is called the blockchain. So in Bitcoin, where blockchains were introduced for the first time, what you did, oh, that one shouldn't be there, sorry, yeah? Means can be destroyed, or what is immutable? Uh, I'm getting to that here, but immutable means that it cannot be changed after the fact. So we cannot change the Bitcoin history. So we have the full like transaction history in this blockchain, and you can't go back to a certain block and say, this transaction that I made in 2012, that didn't happen. It's impossible. Or at least that's by defi uh, design when it comes to this technology. So the way that you can think uh, about a blockchain, the most like, high level overview that I could give you is that you can think of this as a spreadsheet, an append-only spreadsheet that is immutable that we cannot change. So every row would contain transactions, and then those transactions would be linked to one another. How you do that is that you take the hash of a specific row. So for example, let's say that we have one row of transactions in this spreadsheet. If we go ahead and hash that information, we will get a fixed length string that indicates what is the content of that row. If we do that in every block preceding or every row, then we will have a chain that is linked with hashes. And this is cryptographically, uh, cryptographically secured by design. So this makes Bitcoin immutable and the blockchain. So as I said, transactions are grouped into blocks. And for Bitcoin, new blocks are created every 10 minutes by this system and network of computers. And also, how they do that, how they reach consensus, because all computers in this network, they say that the same blockchain is valid. And this is the true like revolution 
when it comes to Bitcoin and blockchains overall is that they have a consensus protocol that all of these computers have to follow in order to be part of the network. And this is why we can trust every node, every computer, every agent on the network. So what that consensus protocol states, it's called Nakamoto consensus after Satoshi Nakamoto for Bitcoin, is that the majority will decide what chain is the valid one. And also, in order to vote on new valid blocks, in order to find a new solution to a cryptographic problem that is called mining, then you actually have to stake some sort of resource. And when it comes to Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain, that resource is computing power. So they try to solve a puzzle, computers, in order to vote and say, we have a new valid block here with transactions. This is what happens every 10 minutes. And this whole process, this whole like, consensus algorithm is called proof of work. I think that another speaker is going to go more in depth into this later. Yes? Is every node involved in every blockchain? Is every node? Involved in every blockchain? No, so the Bitcoin network is one network uh, of nodes. And then the Ethereum blockchain has another like network of nodes. So when it comes to we have many, many different blockchain solutions today. Bitcoin was the th first one. But now we have hundreds of different ones. And all of these are separate like network of nodes that maintain them. Yes? So every node has a copy of four transactions? I mean, like on exactly. So I, I mean, if we have time, uh, I'll do that quickly. What I can show you here, here's my terminal. And I have an interface to the Ethereum blockchain here, which is a, another like very common blockchain. It's the second uh, most valuable blockchain according to market cap after Bitcoin. But what I'm doing now is that I'm actually downloading the most recent blocks. So I have a copy of the Ethereum blockchain on my laptop here. And as I said, it's like around 500 gigabytes. So it's a lot of disk space, but it's every transaction that has ever happened. So it, exactly. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself now uh, in my slides. But no, 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 no. I just want to touch on it first because there, there are two reasons actually. And one is the incentive if you're actually like mining and if you're validating new blocks. But I'm not doing that with my computer. I would never win the mining process because my laptop is not optimized to do that. But the reason why I have the Ethereum blockchain is that I, because I want to interact with it. I want to develop applications on it. And then if I have the Ethereum blockchain, now I'm really getting ahead of myself, then I can interact with smart contracts that are stored here. They are almost like transactions. But otherwise, we have the monetary incentive, just as you said. Uh, any distributed network with multiple nodes, there's this problem of atomicity. It's yes. a part of the consensus protocol. Okay. So uh, the Bitcoin blockchain was the first one to solve the Byzantine like, generals problem, where we have the double spend problem. How these nodes in a uh, computer network, how they actually can carry the same exact copy of a valid ledger and how they know how to converge, because on the internet we have delays on the network, right? And then we might have malicious actors and attackers in the system that try to like fake transactions, might try to fake the, to say I have a Bitcoin that I don't. But it's all part of the consensus protocol. I could talk about that for 30 minutes also. Unfortunately, I don't have time. But yeah, feel free to connect with me later. Or I think that another speaker will touch upon it later also. But so this question was asked, just now, why do people want to be part of this network? Well, so for miners, the people that actually spend like computational resources in order to solve a puzzle, to cast a vote on new valid blocks in the blockchain, they have a monetary incentive. So every time they do this process, if they are the winner to solve the puzzle first, they will be rewarded in Bitcoin. So also, this is a great way for the community to distribute new money into the world. It doesn't have to be a person that actually owns the money and picks whoever is going to get it. But it is the people that maintain the ledgers and the network. Yes? So the monetary incentive, the, the reward, is that the I pay the bit? Because there's that little bit that you pay for the Exactly. So I've written it here, like plus transaction fees. So that is not the reward. That's not the, reward. the reward is part of the block, and it's called a Coinbase okay. uh, that inspired a huge startup in this uh, Area also to, with their name. So let's say you did a transaction to the nearest node. Yeah. So what kind of latency is involved? Because every node has to be updated, right? I mean, 
Exactly. So there is some latency, and also yeah, your transaction. <laughs> but it, I mean, it, in the beginning, it was all fine. Like the, the network is very clogged now when we have so many transactions. Um, and also, if you pay a higher transaction fee, then it's much more probable that a miner will include your transaction in the most recent block because they sort them. They, I mean, they want to be rewarded as much as possible. So we could see this happening when the Bitcoin price kept on like climbing in November and December that the transaction fees also went up, skyrocketed. I did one Bitcoin transaction where I had to pay around $20 only to send $40 uh, to my friend. So, I mean, then it doesn't become feasible, right? But there are a lot of latencies and there are a lot of differences in the most recent block. But that is why we have one miner validating a new block and then it broadcasts a new block with transactions to the network and since uh, that node was the first one to come up with this new solution. Then everyone else will have to propagate to that longest chain because that is part of the consensus protocol that you should always follow the longest chain. And probabilistically, that will also be the case because the more nodes and miners that work on the longest blockchain, then it will keep on getting longer and the other ones will lag behind. Yes? So do miners solve the double spec problem then? Is that what this? Yes, the whole consensus protocol powering the miners and this proof of work algorithm solves the double spend problem. And the question of transaction mm -hmm. on one base, does it last it to every node or a subset of the nodes? Yes, after a while it ends up at every node. I'm sorry? After a while it ends up at every node. When the transaction has happened, it will be included in a block. When that block is validated and part of the blockchain, then every node in the network will have that block because every node in the network will have a copy of the blockchain. So when you do what that... Was initially, I first a request for the Then it will propagate through the network. It goes to a subset of the nodes? Exactly. So I mean, it spreads in the network, right? Just as information on the internet, for example. Uh, a node that you have close to you. Yeah. And then it propagates through the network. So I mean, wherever it reaches first, through whatever means in like the, uh, by, by using it, the internet. Now my ledger, my so I'm fairness not and all that is an issue is what you're trying to say. Because then I'm not validating. So, so much for this distributed valid. being good. But, but, but there are many, many other solutions that will, uh, are trying to like improve the scalability of public blockchains. So I'm talking about public blockchains now and this like, Trustless system. I think you're, you're going to talk about permission blockchains, right? I'm not a huge believer in that, unfortunately, but it's good I, I to have disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the beauty of this is the trustless nature and that anyone can mine. And when it comes to Bitcoin, it has really had scalability issues, but there are other blockchains that are addressing this in a very smart way. And there are also protocol extensions that we will see in the future. But all of this is getting into like nitty gritty detail. But everything that I will tell you is that people are working on this. And people also said that the internet wouldn't be able to scale in like the beginning of the 90s. That email would like crash the internet and uh, attachments to emails would take down the internet. So the internet has like failed to scale for many, many years. And it still does when we have like 4K video on YouTube. People say it's not gonna hold. Yes. What's the average time for company transaction? It also depends. When the network was clogged, it could be three hours. But it should be 10 minutes, right? Because it's, uh, the block time is 10 minutes. And then the more blocks you wait to be validated, the more secure you can be and trust that this transaction is actually. Like anywhere between three hours and 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah and it, it, I mean, if you set your transaction fee by yourself, usually like if you, if you use Coinbase, or a wallet that will set the, the transaction fee according to what is like the average on the network right now. Um, but if you adjusted it to be lower, then it might actually like, <laughs> your transaction might go somewhere and it might never get validated or it might take many, many, many days in order for it to get validated. Yeah. So are all nodes have equal capacity or is there a master slave or is there a single gateway for all the transactions to pass through? What is the hierarchy? Is there a hierarchy of, uh, so it's a distributed network and all nodes, I mean, the capacity is your computational capacity. How fast you can solve these cryptographic puzzles. 
So they have specific hardware to do this for Bitcoin right, so that's called that's ASIC that's chips. The, the voting power, like, uh, right. yeah, okay. all of that. No, like, master node controls these other nodes that validate the network. Um, should I continue? Yeah. <laughs> so I want to walk you through uh, a Bitcoin transaction end to end here. And the way I want to do that is that I want to talk about Bob. He's an online merchant, and he decides to start to accept Bitcoin as payment. So let's say that he sells like socks. And then we have Alice. She loves buying socks online. She finds Bob's store and decides to buy a couple of floral socks for herself to like treat herself. The way that this transaction would happen now if they settle it on the Bitcoin blockchain would be that both Bob and Alice, as I said before, they would op open up wallets to have addresses and in order to sign transactions. And then since Bob hasn't received any Bitcoin before, he will have to open up a new address in his wallet. Uh, and then he, <clears throat> he would send his public address to Alice, right? Then Alice, in turn, would tell her wallet that she wants to send some Bitcoin to Bob's address in order to pay for the floral socks that she's about to buy. What will happen then in the wallet is that the private key will sign the transaction. And this, uh, what happens is that the private key encrypts a message and then the whole network, with the use of the public key that everyone has, then it can decrypt that message and validate the signature. So if it's possible with the private key to decrypt the message, you can be 100% certain that it has been signed by the private key. So then this transaction is broadcasted to the network now. And then I have three miners here. They are called Gary, Garth, and Glenn in this picture. What they will do is that they will bundle the transaction into a block, as I've said before, together with a lot of other transactions. And then their computers will start to mine. So they will start to calculate a cryptographic puzzle. Since I'm running out of time, um, I won't go into the details of that. But you can think of this as a very difficult problem to solve by guessing. The computers has to guess a lot of times in order to reach a specific solution uh, that is very easy to verify once it has been reached, but it's impossible to guess it. I mean, you don't have a structured way of guessing it. You have to brute force it. <clears throat> so this is what the miners do in order to validate transactions and say that, OK, I am the winner of this block reward that we talked about. I have created the newest block in the blockchain. What I said when they, that the computers have to guess when it, it comes to like a specific input in order to create a certain output, then we do this uh, by making use of a beautiful mathematical construct called hash functions. Hash functions are extremely important when it comes to blockchains and Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies. So the way that they work, uh, for those of you who don't know that, is that a hash function is a deterministic function. So whenever you give it the same input, it will always produce the same output. It's also a one-way function. So a hash function, when you give it a specific input, it will give you an output, it will always be the same, but it's impossible to recreate the input by looking at the output. And I really like this analogy that we have a blender. So that could be the hash, hash function. And then the input are fruits, and the output that we get is a smoothie, right? <laughs> and it's impossible to recreate the fruits by having the smoothie. So uh, that's how you can think of a hash function. Also, they are extremely useful in order to prove something without revealing the exact information. So let's say now that all of us, the, our students at UC Berkeley, we are competing against one another to get a good grade. Grades are on a scale today, unfortunately. So it will be like a distribution of grades. So let's say that I've found the answer to a problem set. And I really want to brag about it. <laughs> Everyone in, in here, you, you haven't found it yet, but I have. And I don't want to share the solution with you, but I still want to prove that I've found the solution. Then I can make use of a hash function. Then I will put in my solution, let's say that it's the number 42. The hash function, it could be MD5 that I have here, or SHA-256 that is very common in the Bitcoin realm. It will produce a specific output. It will be a fixed length string, but it won't tell you anything about the solution that I have. Then we can keep this string. Everyone can see it. 
And then when the teacher in like two weeks releases the answer, we can see that it was 42. Then we take the teacher's answer into the same hash function and we will get the same hash string. So that way I can prove that I had the solution without revealing it beforehand to you. It's a very beautiful mathematical construct. And when it comes to the blockchain, it actually utilizes hashes on hashes. So I said that every block was linked to one another through, through like hashing the content and then including the hash of the content of the previous block and the current block, we create this immutable chain. These chains of hashes are called Merkle trees. And I think this technology is going to be prevalent like everywhere. Uh, we can see that Apple right now in their new version of like OS X, their whole file system is going to be hashed in Merkle trees. And the reason for that is because it's extremely easy to identify if someone has changed any information in the file system. So as you can see here, now let's say that the hashes are actually like colors. So we give some input into hash functions. We get a color as an output. This is the fixed length string, but I'm simplifying it right now. Then if we take the red and the yellow, these are two hashes, right? We can combine them and create a new hash because a hash function can have any type of input and it will always create a fixed length output. So then we combine the red and the yellow uh, hashes. We put them through a hash function and then we get the orange output here in the picture to the left. And then we do the same thing with the input that we have at the top here with the blue and the green. We put those two hashes into a hash function combined. We get that like dark blue, whatever, and then towards the end we combine the orange and the dark blue and we get this like military green at the bottom. That is called the root hash of a Merkle tree. What is so beautiful about this is that if any of the hashes, if any of the content in this whole tree changes, then the color at the bottom of the root hash will change and it's very easy to track where the change has happened. This is why Apple is going to use this in their file system because it will be almost impossible for anyone to make it corrupt. Also what I can tell you is that if we have a slight change in the input to a hash function, we will get a completely different output. So let's say that I put in all of the text in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, all of those three books. So I put that into a hash function. It, it can be of arbitrary input. We can put anything into a hash function. Then I will get a hash, fixed length, a string as an output. But if I only removed one dot, in that whole like trilogy of uh, novels, anywhere in the book. If I pass that through the same hash function, the output would be completely different. So it's very easy to detect if something has changed. And this is cool. This is how we can like link chains together and be sure that no one has tampered with the transaction history of the blockchain. So then uh, at the end, now the miners have validated a new block. They will be rewarded what is called the Coinbase, the reward for the block, plus that they will collect the transaction fees. Um, and in the case when this infographic was created, the reward was 50 Bitcoins, it's 12.5 today. And then this transaction will be buried in the blockchain. Let me check the time, yes? Is this whole double spend that's not occurring and so on? Yeah, exactly. Is that part of that verification process? So, I mean, I don't have the time to go into the, all of the nuances when it comes to Nakamoto consensus, but basically how you validate a transaction is that when you have the private key, then you can claim ownership of funds in the Bitcoin blockchain. So because we have the complete transaction history, so the way that you track transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain is that you have unspent transaction outputs, so you can claim them with your private key. And first of all, the nodes, the miners, will check, okay, is this really the owner of some Bitcoin? And then when they have aggregated how much Bitcoin you have, they will say, okay, how much is the user, uh, how much does the user want to spend? So, so the question is, are they as needed figuring out how much you own, or are they tracking continuously? Yeah, the whole uh, transaction history. They have to validate everything. Yeah, but given a new set of uh, transactions that they have received, yeah. are they picking up one transaction at a time in addition to thinking about these fees? That so they are grouping transactions into blocks, right? And then they have to validate this block. And that was a slide that I said that I didn't have time to go over when they are actually like solving this cryptographic puzzle. Yeah, but that, and beyond all that, individually verifying that 
you are sending money that you actually own and things like that. Yeah. Are they doing that? The, the, the miners and the nodes are doing that, yeah, yes. For them to do that, how much of work do they have to do? Forget for the time being. Okay, it's not that difficult to scan the blockchain. It has... In the beginning, every time they are doing this? Yeah, they, I mean, they have to look for unspent transaction outputs. And it's kind of easy to query the blockchain. I mean, I can do that on my computer and see, uh, look for specific transactions, see the complete like history of those transactions. Because as you could see also, new Bitcoins were created in this mining process when you were given like the Coinbase. So we can see how all of the Bitcoins, how they have moved over the network. And this is how you also like validate that a user actually has the funds, that they are the owner and can make so, the transactions. So you're saying they are not on an ongoing basis keeping track of, for all the users in the system, how much money they have? Oh, they are. I know, but so it's, not, it's not that computationally. He's asking, is there a running total yeah, for me? Exactly. Do I have a running balance that, that somewhere on the blockchain says, Bill has 10 Bitcoin? Or is it going back to the beginning yeah, and saying, exactly. what has happened and at the yes. how much did Bill have? So the ladder. The, the, exactly, it's the latter because we have unspent transaction output. It works different in, on Ethereum because then you have accounts. But I, I don't, like, I removed that slide. I could be here for 10 hours and talk about this. Uh, I really love this. But yeah, it's exactly what you said, the latter, that it actually has to scan the full like, transaction history to see the outputs that hasn't been spent. Yeah, because otherwise it would be dangerous. Somebody could be sitting there saying, aha, uh -huh. So-and-so has 100 Bitcoins and so-and-so has 10 Bitcoins. Yeah. That could be exactly. quite a scary thing. So this makes Bitcoin very like tamper-proof and resistant yeah. against hacks. And that is the reason why they chose unspent transaction outputs as balances of accounts instead of like having accounts that were updated. Yes? So the local tree that you showed there, where are new transactions added? Is it on the leaf or? So if we go back to the uh, Merkle tree, we can look at another example here. So here we have the blocks, right? And then new transactions are added, grouped together with the block. And then we hash it and we create a new hash that we put in the current block. And that is how they are linked together. So then if anything happens here, then the color would change completely, right? Because then we would get another output for, for a hash. And then we can see, OK, someone is actually trying to change the Bitcoin blockchain. But it's a single yeah, link that list. Is so it's, it's okay, but when you have this tree kind of structure mm -hmm. left, right, where would a new block go in this? Case? Then we can see that we actually take a lot of hashes of the different transactions, and that is why we make use of a Merkle tree into one block. And so if I was working on one at the time, and I converge on that node and go, oh, there's a new one, I spit out, I dump everything I've done, pull the new one. But then the transaction would still be unconfirmed, so that would get grouped into the next block, right, for, for the transaction that didn't happen. As I said in the beginning of this lecture. Yeah, we have like forking and stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> there are so many details to all of this that it's ridiculous. And as I said in the beginning of the lecture, like I've seriously had more than 20 like major aha moments when it comes to my understanding of blockchains. And I love going to conferences like this. I love listening to lectures because this is a whole new field of technology that might actually disrupt how we interact with the world and how we live our lives in the future. So it, it's almost like getting into the magic of the internet in the early 90s. So welcome to that whole journey, everyone in here. And every question is like a good question. Unfortunately, I can't be here for a week. <laughs> we will have to reschedule and do that another time. But now I only want to mention that Bitcoin magically, we have network money, we have digital money. It fulfills all of the characteristics of a currency. So let's look at them. Well, first of all, and currencies should be scarce. We shouldn't be able to like, print new currencies or create new currencies out of thin air. And that is the case for Bitcoin. It actually has finite units, and it's a deflationary currency in comparison to like, the US dollar or any other like, state-owned currency that usually are inflationary. There will only exist 21 million Bitcoins in total in history. And we will reach this amount in 2140. And that is because the mining reward is halved every four years. This is how it's a deflationary currency. Also, a currency should be fungible. So you should be able to like, trade one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin, and then there shouldn't be a difference. What you have to keep in mind when it comes to the cryptocurrencies is that uh, don't swap Bitcoins with a criminal. <laughs> that might be bad because the 
FBI might confiscate it. Also, cryptocurrency uh, or currencies overall should be divisible. So, so we should have uh, some sort of subunits. And that is the case for Bitcoin as well. Uh, in Bitcoin, we have Satoshis. And one Satoshi is 10 to the power of minus 8 Bitcoins. So this makes it possible that we can't like, only do uh, transactions that are $19,000. <laughs> but we can actually divide them up into smaller pieces. And then they should also be durable. And as I said, uh, Bitcoin is a durable currency because in order to take it down, in order to actually destroy the network, we have to destroy all of the computers. If we destroy 99.999% of the computers, Bitcoin will still survive because there will be one or two computers that still has the full transaction history and you can claim ownership of your Bitcoins. They should also be transferable and this is a global payment network so that is all fine. And then they should be legitimate. So I mean we trust the central reserve or uh, the central banks etc when they are issuing money. Now I believe that there, there is like huge trust in the Bitcoin protocol and network as well and the blockchain as a technology because this technology has not been hacked for over a decade, even though the bug bounty for like hacking this network is several billion dollars. <laughs> so it's remarkable. And with that, uh, yes. You said that the one of the needs for it is with deflationary purpose, right? What do you mean by deflationary? Number of coins are not going to increase. What means? So um, the characteristics of a currency that I talked about was scarcity. So the, a currency should be scarce. There shouldn't exist like uh, an infinite amount of this currency because otherwise it won't have any value. And the only, uh, I mean, Bitcoin by design is deflationary. That it was something that the community powering this and when they decided upon the protocol, they said that it should be deflationary. I even think it was in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper when he outlined the technology. So there will only be 21 million Bitcoin in total. And that is a deflationary currency that we won't be printing anything, any new after. Lightning network could be something because you know Bitcoin is actually widely adopted, if we see in a way. Is it, so, so one of my friends is a developer on the Lightning network. So this way, what the Lightning, Lightning network is, is that you would settle transactions off chain yeah. to like limit uh, the amount of work that the nodes need to do in order to settle transactions. Yeah. And there has been a lot of work done at this, but when it comes to public blockchains, permissionless blockchains, blockchains that anyone can join, trustless systems like this, it's very hard to dance around the problem, to not have one say, central agency that you need to trust. So also the Lightning Network, then you need to trust these nodes that settle the transactions. And even though there will be different groups, it might only be one, two, or three computers, and that is a problem they are struggling with. There are a lot of nuances to these like consensus protocols and stuff, but I am very, very, very optimistic when it comes to the future. And this was exactly the case in like 92, 93, when people said that the internet won't have like any effect on the future, etc. And look how we use that today and how it's integrated into our everyday lives. And so many smart people around the planet are contributing to this technology and these systems today. So I think it's going to be a revolution. Yes. Exactly, but since uh, I said that you have to stake some resources, and in Bitcoin's case, in order to validate transactions, you have to stake computational resources. You have to solve this cryptographic puzzle. So in order to attack the network and gain 51% of the voting power, you will have to outspend the network when it comes to electricity right now. So. Since the Bitcoin network uses as much electricity every second as the nation state of Colombia that has 58 million people in it, then you would basically have to hijack all of the, half of the electricity in Colombia. And in order to perform an attack, you would have to do that for a long time in order to compete with the rest of the network. And no one has that kind of resources. And by that time, you would discover that something is... Exactly. And also, I mean, if you attack the network, and you brought it down, then you have no monetary incentive for that because everyone would lose trust in Bitcoin and then a Bitcoin would be worth zero dollars when it had been attacked. So that's also a built-in mechanism for like keeping this alive. Yes? So uh, I heard you say that the complete No, but so, I mean, Bitcoin has failed to scale in that way to settle transactions quickly, but then we have the Ethereum blockchain that settles block every nine seconds. 
So then it works. I mean, you can wait nine or 18 seconds in order to show that your transaction is actually valid. And if you need something to uh, be included in the most recent block, you can slightly increase your uh, transaction fee. But let's move beyond Bitcoin. So we have talked a lot about Bitcoin now, and I will have to speed up for it because there's so much I would like to cover. But so Bitcoin was the first one to combine these three novel approaches in order to create some sort of like digital money. So cryptographic identities with public and private key pairs that we have talked about. The consensus protocol, this like proof of work, the mining of new blocks, and then the blockchain. This like immutable ground source of truth when it comes to all of the transactions that have ever happened on this network. But a computer whiz kid in the mid 90s also had an idea about uh, people being able to run smart contracts on computers. So in order to understand what a smart contract is, we have to define a normal contract first. And I think most of you know what a contract is. It's an agreement between two parties or several entities. You sign the contract. It has a lot of terms um, that you have to fulfill, etc. And then you might have some like ending line, what will happen in the contract when certain events are triggered. So Nick Saspo, a computer scientist from, uh, uh, I think he's here from the US, he, he defined the con uh, concept of a smart contract instead. So he said that we could outline all of the terms, clauses, and paragraphs of a contract in actual like computer code so that it would be programmatically executed with conditional statements. If this happens, then we will have this output. If this happens, then we will have the other output, et cetera. This was a r remarkable idea. Um, and also, then we only had to trust the program that we could see, the actual code. Because uh, if I go into a bet with someone, let's say that we bet uh, $10,000, and I say that um, you, you will get $10,000 if the US wins the World Cup in soccer. <laughs> exactly. And, but, but, and you tell me that Sweden, I'm from Sweden, by the way. I haven't said that, but that's my accent. So you say that Swe I say, I want $10,000 from you if Sweden wins the World Cup in soccer. And then, I mean, it's very unlikely that any of the countries will win the World Cup. So it might be like a safe bet. But it, let's say that the US surprises and they actually win the World Cup. I would never pay you that money. I would be like, no, 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 that, that wasn't a true bet. Even if we had signed the contract, I would be like, no, 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 I was only kidding. If we had a smart contract that were linked to our bank accounts, then if that smart contract was triggered by the event that the US actually won the World Cup, you would get the money. I would have no way to claim my funds. This is like the beauty of smart contracts, that we are able to trust computer code all of a sudden. So we had Satoshi Nakamoto in 2010. In 2013, another like computer whiz kid from Canada named Vitalik Buterin enter this like blockchain scene. He started out by contributing a lot to the Bitcoin core protocol and the technology. So he was part of the whole like open source ecosystem. He wrote a lot of computer code in the beginning of Bitcoin so that it could work. But he got frustrated by the limited capabilities of Bitcoin. We have talked a lot about that today. And he said that he wanted to build blockchains that could process computer code that had um, a very like sophisticated scripting language. Uh, he introduced a lot of new concepts to the Bitcoin community, but they were very like rudimentary and they said, no, we won't incorporate this because it might uh, take away from the safety aspect that they hold so dear in the Bitcoin community. So what Vitalik did then was that he in 2013 uh, went away and wrote his own white paper and introduced Ethereum to the world. So what Ethereum is, is that it's a blockchain-based smart contract platform. It has a native currency called Ether, abbreviated ETH. So just like Bitcoin has BTC, Ether also is a currency uh, on the Ethereum blockchain instead. But what is unique about this blockchain solution and this technology is that this is a network of computers that has a state. And that state determines all of the states of computer code that we have pushed to this network in smart contracts. 
So this is a global distributed computer that is able to run smart contracts and keep smart contracts valid. So just as we've said that all of the nodes in the Bitcoin network validate transactions in new blocks, then all of the nodes in the Ethereum network actually validates the state of all of the smart contracts as well as transactions and account balances. And now we get into like the true revolution of blockchains and why they are so powerful. Yes? Exactly. I mean, it's beautiful. So every node will check the state of this computer instead of like only looking at the block and the hashes of blocks, then this computer will actually have a state, not just the transactions. So if we, I have a smart contract that somehow depends on me sending an email, then that contract will have a state that is the email is not sent, the email is not sent, and then when I trigger an event, I, so I send the email, that contract will be fulfilled and the state will change of the whole network because the condition in that smart contract has been fulfilled and triggered by an external event that it looks for. So I said that this was a distributed world computer and we, we could like have these smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. So we could also have smart contracts call other smart contracts. And by this, we could build very complex systems of decentralized applications. So we wouldn't have any centralized agency anymore, any like third party any intermediary that hosted these applications, but they could be run on this distributed world computer. Yes? But why is the currency and uh, the system, uh, why do they have to be the same? Really good question. And if we go down to the third bullet point here, we can see that smart contracts requires gas in order to be run. So somehow, we have to incentivize these computers to be part of the network and also to spend computational resources in order to evaluate the smart contracts, right? So what we do is that we pay them gas. Since this is computer code, it can be arbitrarily complex. You can even send an infinite loop to these computers. It's, uh, since this is a Turing complete programming language, that we, we can construct any type of program we want and have that as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. But so if we send an infinite loop, we don't want to clog up the network and that all of the computers are working on a loop forever. So you actually have to spend resources in order to run smart contracts. And the infinite loop would uh, get so expensive that it would be ridiculous. You would lose like billions of dollars if you let that run for a day. Uh, so it's not worth it. And this is how we incentivize the miners and the nodes to be part of this so network. Who decides what the gas is? Uh, it's the community, and also it depends on uh, how much pressure the network is under right now, how much computational resources are available. Yes? So how is it architecturally different that you can do transaction in nine seconds versus 10 minutes? In so it, it's only that the block time is quicker. I mean, Bitcoin has, by design, said that it's going to take 10 minutes. So they, they actually, this cryptographic puzzle that you have to solve, they keep on adjusting that difficulty because computers also get better, right? We might have ASIC chips that can work on these puzzles. They, they are better today than they were three years ago. They might even be like, have double capacity. So uh, the difficulty of mining these blocks are increased through a process of like nonces and leading zeros for uh, the output of hash functions. But when it comes to Ethereum, they want to have a quicker a settlement of like new states in this distributed world computer because you don't want to wait 10 minutes in order to see what is the output of your smart contract, right? right. So it's only that the difficulty to validate blocks is easier. Yeah? Can you talk more about the queuing complete, the programmatic, any programmatic code can run? I mean, what do you mean by that? Absolutely. So when it comes, I mean, Bitcoin on its blockchain, they have a scripting language. It's very rudimentary, it's very simple. Uh, so, for example, on the Bitcoin blockchain, you cannot create for loops. You cannot have any loops at all. And in order to do, like, if-else statements, you would have to copy-paste them over and over again. And this becomes very cumbersome. Yeah, so how you program smart contracts, most of the time you would use Solidity. That is a programming language that is very close to JavaScript and C in its syntax. And that will be compiled down to Ethereum bytecode that is much closer to the hardware, so they will run efficiently. And then that will be executed by the Ethereum virtual machine. But so 
only to make sure that you, when you leave here now, or when I leave the stage at least, you understand what smart contracts are. So these are stored on the Ethereum blockchain. They are evaluated by all the nodes in the network, as I said. They are transparent, so I can go and check the content of every smart contract ever put on the Ethereum blockchain. Everyone can like validate what they do. You can call smart contracts as someone else has programmed. It's not like one specific person owns it, but anyone can call all the smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain and be like inspired to build your own by looking at how other works. Also, when smart contracts call other smart contracts, these are called decentralized applications or dApps. Now dApps are what you've heard when it comes to all of the ICOs, the initial coin offerings and stuff. These are decentralized applications, applications that make use of blockchain technology when you don't have to trust any type of third party, etc. So also when miners validate contracts that are related to dApps, they will be rewarded in the native token for that decentralized application. There are many, many different decentralized applications. Unfortunately, I cannot dive into that, but I think that over 3,000 dApps or new currencies have been introduced only through the Ethereum blockchain. So when you introduce a new currency on an existing blockchain, that is called an ICO or an initial coin offering. This is a play on words for an initial public offering. But why you want to do this? I mean, we had an ICO mania last year. You probably heard about ICOs raising like several hundred million dollars for new technology of a startup that hadn't been like released in any form of beta. It was only a promise to the world. But the reason why we have ICOs is that this incentivizes a community, like normal people, to buy into an idea and be part of it from the start. So this is great and empowering for people who want to like start startups because they don't have to go to venture capitalists. They don't have to get permission from anyone. They only have to develop their solution, post it to the public, show how it works, everything is transparent, right? And then they say, I have this promise to the world and I would like to get funds in order to realize that promise. It's also really good because if you have a network of people that buys into your idea from the beginning, you can enjoy scale factors. And also all of the services that we enjoy today, like Uber or Facebook, they benefit from network effects. The more people that use the service, so for Uber, for example, the more people that use it, the more drivers we will see, the more drivers we will see, the more convenient it will be to go somewhere. So that is a network effect. And it's very important when it comes to like, uh, all the platforms and the technology that we use today. So Ethereum can be used for a lot of stuff. Here you have an extensive list of what it can be implemented for. I won't go over it line by line because I have to bear in mind of the time that I have today, unfortunately. And I have an even bigger picture of all of the blockchain projects that I think are very, very interesting today. So I will send out my slides somehow and feel free to like dive into this because it's remarkable <coughs> once you get into like the nuances and what these projects are trying to solve. Uh, yeah. Uh, Please, you I really like the BAT project, for example, with the Brave browser that is trying to disrupt how like ads work uh, in your browser and how it takes time from when you like read the New York Times, for example, and how you're compensated in that process. Because right now when it comes to ad tech overall, it's very diluted and it ruins the experience both for the advertisers, for the journalists, and the actual like, consumers of the article. And they have a really good solution to this that is integrated in a browser and then they also have a native token called BAT that aims to solve this problem. BAT has BAT. Uh, BAT, exactly. And it's, uh, the reason why I like it also is because the founder is the guy who actually wrote JavaScript from scratch. So he's very credible uh, in the Silicon Valley. And I, I think he's a great founder. He's been part of many credible projects before, so that has a lot of potential. But here you have my list of all the projects I think that are exciting. And many of them will be worth more money than bats. <laughs> I promise you that. Yes? Uh, do you think, what do you think about Sierra Coin and POS? Sierra? Roughly like 80 minutes talking about the technology. I hope that you have a better understanding of how uh, blockchains work, why Bitcoin was such a huge like revolution, 
and also how Ethereum works and that it could power these smart contracts. So now I want to go over some of the industries that could actually get disrupted by blockchain technology and that are disrupted today by blockchain technology. So first, let's start with the most obvious one, financial technology. Blockchain is disrupting almost everything in finance today because we've had a decade long of a runway with Bitcoin leading the way. And now people have realized how easy it is to use cryptocurrencies to actually make like payments, etc., more efficient. So first and foremost, and what I think is most important is that with the use of blockchain technology, we will actually be able to bank the 2 billion people that are outside of the global financial system. And we will also be able to increase the uh, capabilities of the 4 billion people on the planet that are underbanked. Blockchain technology can also help us do instant verification of payments. For example, if I'm going to send payment or any type of funds to Sweden, to my parents now from my bank account here in America, that takes several days in order to be settled. With blockchain technology, it could take nine seconds, 10 minutes, something like that. It's remarkable. Also, I said that in the beginning, but I looked into how to improve the whole system of remittances and humanitarian aid with blockchain technology. So for remittances, then many people, uh, for example, from Thailand come to Sweden in order to work over the summer or work for six months and send back money to Thailand. The transaction fees that they pay are equivalent to anywhere between 15 to 25% in order to make that transfer. Uh, it might not be to Thailand, but it, to parts of the developing world that don't have a good like, banking system. This is crazy. With cryptocurrencies, that transaction fee could be 0.01% quite easily. Also, when it, it, because of the transparent nature of blockchain technology, that we actually can audit it, what has happened ever since the beginning of time to where we are today, then we can actually, when it comes to humanitarian aid, if I send some money to anywhere in the, like the developed world and I say, I want this money to become a whiteboard in a classroom, then I can track my money step by step, all of the agencies and stuff that have made use of it and see that it ends up being a blackboard if we had a verification system like that. It's remarkable. Also, since these systems are self-powering, we might be able to like have 24-hour stock exchanges finally <laughs> on the planet because I think it's ridiculous that it, they close after like 4 p.m. or whatever in New York right now. And with the use of blockchains, we could also have peer-to-peer -peer loans because we could have these contracts, right? So I could take a loan from you as a private person and I could trust that the contracts and the terms in the contracts would actually be fulfilled without having to go to a bank or an escrow agent or whatever. Blockchain is also disrupting healthcare. So there is a pilot right now running in Estonia where they have digitalized all of their health records in blockchains so that the individuals or the residents of Estonia can access them through biometric markers, like a fingerprint or a retina scan. No one else can access them, so it's truly empowering for the individuals. This is also very important uh, if we're able to aggregate like medical data, sensitive data, on like what people have done when they have visited the doctor, if like treatment for depression has been successful or not. If we're able to aggregate these in secure systems like the blockchain without revealing the information, then researchers could access the information in this data and that could power a lot of the artificial intelligence systems that we are creating today in order to further improve uh, current like, state-of-the-art research and find nuances in all of this information that will lead us to like, have cures for diseases, etc. It would be extremely powerful. So when you have read about blockchains, you have probably seen that it's also disrupting how supply chain management works. So the things that I believe in, first and foremost, blockchains can help us to not have such huge like paper trails and documents. Uh, when we, a cargo is sent from port to port, they will have to document that it has actually arrived. They will put it down on a paper. Someone needs to sign it. We have many, many entities that we need to trust in this whole chain. What we could do instead is, by the use of the Internet of Things, sensors everywhere, we can track that actual cargo ships have arrived, that they have the specific weight they should, that they have the temperature that they should throughout the journey. 
et cetera, this would be carried out automatically. We wouldn't have to trust a person to like do the measurements and put them on paper, which actually still happens today, and they will be tracked <coughs> on a blockchain. So it will also be immutable. Everyone can see that it actually has happened, what timestamps, et cetera. Bear in mind that we still have the edge case, that we will have some device that actually takes in the information and stores it on a blockchain. And that is a problem that no one really has been able to figure out how to solve. Blockchains would be, will be remarkable when it comes to food safety also. Because let's say that we have some sort of chicken with a disease that is being sold at one grocery store. Today, it takes a lot of time in order for them to figure out what is the source of this chicken and trace it, trace it back. With the use of blockchain, we can see that instantly if we had the correct like, access rights into this system where we had tracked all of our food and where it comes from. Then we can also make sure that we're eating an organic apple when we have the stamp that it's an organic apple on it, for example. And then it's also that like, uh, blockchains will be extremely powerful when it comes to tracking pharmaceuticals. Because then we can make sure that we're not eating a sugar pill, but it's actually been manufactured at a specific location where it says on the blockchain when we're accessing that information by looking at some type of serial code on our medical package. For governments, Estonia is also leading the way when it comes to citizenships stored on the blockchain. Today you will have to walk to like a police station or some sort of government institution in order to get uh, a passport or a driver's license. Now in Estonia, you only need those biometric markers like your thumbprint or your retina scan in order to prove your citizenship. In Sierra Leone, they also had a, an election recently that was powered by blockchain technology. So you can see how powerful this is because we have an immutable chain of information that if someone votes, it's impossible to change that vote. We don't have to trust specific people to actually put in the information, who did you vote for, into the blockchain, but we could do that ourselves. And then we can verify that that information is intact when we get home and when the election is done. So blockchains could be very empowering for individuals. Then in Ukraine, they have started recording uh, land titles and also properties in blockchains. So let's say that you have a corrupt government and they would like burn down all of the land titles and the documents proving that you own something. And they would say, no, you're not the owner of this. You have nothing to prove. This is especially a problem in the developing world. But through blockchain, we can actually counter this. And then this transparent technology will be really good in order for political money to be tracked and see that it's not used in any type of corrupt way. Last but not least, blockchains can be used in the energy sector. So already today, we have uh, systems that are deployed and used with microgrids. So these could be small communities that produce and consume energy. So it can be us in here. Let's say that we live close to one another and we have like solar, solar panels and stuff. I invest a lot of money in solar panels and I want to share that with you. Today we have no way of doing that, but with the use of blockchains and smart contracts, we can actually trigger transactions automatically. So if I produce, I can sell to you as a community and automatically be rewarded in tokens. This is so cool. Last but not least, I only want to go beyond the hype. I know that I'm running over time right now. But to give you a rational perspective of how the field of blockchain looks like right now, the technologies are still in its infancy. It is like we encountered the internet in 1992, 1993, the beginning of the 90s. And we said, wow, this is remarkable. It could change so much. But still, a lot of work needs to be done before we can see like, global adoption of these tools. And so many of these ICOs and other projects, they carry a huge promise. But today, at least, they cannot live up to that promise. That is my uh, bottom line of everything. And also, there is a lot of speculation in this field. So do <laughs> thorough due diligence before investing in any type of project. And be aware of like, frauds and scams. So many people have already lost a lot of money. So be aware of that. Last but not least, in order to truly change the world, our policy frameworks and the regulations, our law, uh, our laws need to be changed in order to accommodate for these new technologies. So we, we, as early adopters in here, we actually have to speak to the lawmakers. And we actually have to uh, 
make them aware of this technology and how it can be used and why it's powerful. I also said that we had the scalability issue of energy consumption, so the Bitcoin network actually consumes as much energy every second as the whole nation state of Colombia with 58 million people. So this is not good for the environment, for the nature, and that is something that we have to tackle also. But overall, and this is my last slide, by the way, <laughs> I'm very positive when it comes to this technology. I think it brings a remarkable promise into the world, and we have so many positive outcomes to look forward to, where users can actually be in control of their own data through this system. We would have financial inclusion, and I've mentioned that over and over again, that we will finally be able to let everyone on the planet become part of the financial system, at least if they have a smartphone and internet access, but that is much more common than a bank account today. Also, we can have a true sharing economy where we don't need to trust any intermediary or any like trusted agency. So we can have a true Airbnb that if I rented your apartment, then you would actually get the money instantly from me through a smart contract. We don't have to spend like any fee to Airbnb in order to do that. And we can still have a reputation system that was tracked on the blockchain. Also, the transparent nature of this technology will uh, make us able to like, prevent corruption, limit corruption all over the world. And uh, what I think is truly astounding is that all of these technologies that I've talked about today, they are free, they are open source, anyone can join these systems, and we are still able to trust them. We pay $10,000 for one Bitcoin. It's a hash on a ledger, and that is remarkable. So with that said, I just want to say congratulations to you guys in here, because you are early adopters. It's like you have discovered the internet in 93 now. So go ahead, go out there, solve the problems, be part of this journey now. And I hope that my talk has been valuable. Thank you so much.